Having become death, Destroyer of Worlds was really just a highlight on one J. Robert Oppenheimer's resume. I mean, what do you do as an encore to giving mankind the ability to destroy itself? Well, I'd like to hold off judgment on a thing like that, sir, until all the facts are in. While the movie bears the name of the physicist that led the Manhattan Project to create the nuclear bomb, the Christopher Nolan prestige film is not your normal cradle-to-grave story, but focuses on the highlight of his career, the bomb. From organizing the top secret towns, to testing, to the fallout from using the bomb, haha, <laughs> fallout, yeah, no, okay. The movie covers Oppenheimer's role in creating the weapon of the century. But you know, you can't exactly collect royalties for creating the nuclear bomb, so you still need a job. And so what did Oppenheimer get up to after the radioactive dust settled? Two years after the end of the war, Oppenheimer was offered a position by Louis Strauss, played in the movie by Robert Downey Jr. In 1947, Oppenheimer became the director of advanced study at Princeton. In an interview on the Institute of Advanced Study, the job allowed him to decompress after the stress of creating the bomb and then having to talk to a bunch of people about creating the bomb and then explaining things that you definitely should not do with the bomb. And when they said advanced to study, they were not kidding. They didn't just put the man who created the nuclear bomb in charge of it, they put the man who introduced the theories that led to it and definitely thought they shouldn't make it on the teaching staff and he was already there. From 1933 to his death in 1955, you may know this guy, Albert Einstein. Oppenheimer had met Einstein in 1932, and according to his obituary for Einstein, they'd become friends over the course of working together after the war. Also happening in 1947 was the formation of the Atomic Energy Commission. The atomic genie could not be put back in the bottle, so the AEC was formed to, you know, at least manage the genie by overseeing policy involving the new technology. Oppenheimer was appointed the chair of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, and in that role, guided nuclear policy for a number of years. His big contribution was suggesting that civilian authorities be in charge of nuclear policy. He also set up Atoms for Peace, designed to allow countries and researchers to share information about nuclear energy while also preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. One of the key hooks to the trailer is someone following up Oppenheimer, implying that the nuclear bomb is such a horrifying weapon, it will ensure world peace by asking, and if they build a bigger bomb? This is one of those lines that plays on audience knowledge that the characters don't have. Namely, we know exactly what happens. They do build even bigger bombs. And while so far the threat of nuclear weapons has prevented full out global conflicts like World War II, it's traded them in for proxy wars. The first step up in destructive capacity came in the form of the hydrogen bomb. The bombs that eventually were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were fission bombs. Essentially, it treats a group of atoms like a game of marbles where the parts of atoms are separated in a snowball, or I guess more accurately, a fireball effect. However, there's even more energy in atoms coming together. So much so, in fact, that we've been living off a continuous fusion reaction the entire time. The sun is a giant sustained fusion reaction. Oppenheimer had explored a hydrogen bomb makeup during the Manhattan Project and knew the consequences of such a weapon. He was against it. You got one job, Doctor. Give me the bomb. Unfortunately, in 1949, the Soviet Union tested their first atomic bomb long before it was assumed that they would. As the logic went, if they have a bomb, we need an even bigger bomb. Oppenheimer wasn't a fan of how much death and destruction such a bomb would cause should it be used. But more importantly, his argument was, how much destruction do you really need? The nuclear arsenal that had already been compiled was enough to be a deterrent, and even bigger bombs didn't really change that metric. Despite his advice, both the Soviet Union and the United States decided to bank on go big or go home. In 1952, the US tested its first hydrogen bomb, followed by the Soviet Union testing theirs in 1953. During that time, Oppenheimer would find himself on several advisory committees. 
He chaired the Department of Defense's Long Range Objectives Panel in 1948 that set about how many nuclear weapons would end up being used in the military. He was also a member of the Science Advisory Committee of the Office of Defense Mobilization, which decides what to do about other people's intentions with nuclear weapons. He participated in Project Charles, which proposed a link to computer system to respond to aerial threats within the U.S. Project Easter River determined that a nuclear war would be survivable with a permanent civil defense system, eventually leading to a turtle telling us to get under our desks. Yep. And cover. Project Lincoln established the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment Air Defense System, or SAGE. Yeah, see? It's not just Nick Fury that's got a thing for forced acronyms. I understood that reference. Oppenheimer became a powerful voice against a nuclear proliferation, and that, along with his opposition to the hydrogen bomb, started to make him unpopular with people who wanted more bombs, and more powerful bombs. Louis Strauss, who gave him the position in the Institute of Advanced Study, would make a heel turn and strip Oppenheimer of his security clearance on FBI evidence that he was a communist. While he did fight the accusations by appearing before Congress, the loss of security clearance remained revoked, and his advisory roles, including with the AEC, ended. But he was still a big old brain full of knowledge and the ability to figure things out, so he continued to work in academia, giving lectures about nuclear responsibility around the world. In 1965, he was diagnosed with throat cancer from the chain smoking that everyone did in the middle of the 20th century, eventually succumbing in 1967 after chemotherapy failed to suppress the cancer. This video, the article it's based on, and the movie in theaters are based on American Prometheus, the triumph and tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin.